narrow gauge mountain railroad. Howdy, I'm Dennis Weaver. For over a century, people have come to ride the train between Durango and Silverton. The tracks were originally laid in 1881 to tap into the Rocky Mountains, silver and gold. But as we'll learn, though it brought vast fortunes out of the mountains, it also delivered millions of experiences, images, and memories, all of them priceless. Today, it delivers an inspiring experience as the oldest continuously running remnant of America's westward expansion. We can still ride it, just as it was back in the beginning, behind vintage steam locomotives in the original cars through some of the most spectacular mountains in Colorado. How are we able to do this? How did this branch of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad survive when all around it others were scrapped and abandoned? <laughs> Well, we don't have all the answers. In fact, much about the early years remains a mystery, since many of the official records were lost or destroyed a long time ago. So to help us reconstruct the past, we'll hear from historians, rail enthusiasts, and longtime employees as we learn about an American legend known as the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad. You know, I, when I started, I was over in the car shop, and we were bringing in these cars that were just um, chicken coops and tool shed. The Dean RG wasn't called the sick man of Wall Street for nothing. It was, it was usually in trouble, real serious trouble. There were a lot of people that talked about trying to save it, and a lot of people who made some minimal efforts. But Mr. Bradshaw came in, and he had the desire and enthusiasm Desire and enthusiasm. No two words better describe the human elements that have kept this train alive. We're in the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad Museum aboard the Nomad, a high-class business car from 1878. And I gotta tell you, it's a great place to jump into the past. We'll follow these gentlemen's conversations as they shed some light on how this train has overcome incredible odds along its tracks through time. Our experience, our environment that we operate in is unbelievably pristine and unique, and, and you get a sense of wilderness. You see what it's like, and then you sit back, and it forces you to say, golly, when the guys built this railroad, or when these miners first came here, how did they make it? How did they make it? It's so rugged and so rough out there. One thing that the viewers might keep in mind when they ride the train and they go over the High Line is that not only that cost a thousand dollars a foot to build, which was a sensational figure then, but imagine when you get tired looking 400 feet down in the Animas Canyon, uh, that they had to blast that that shelf out by having men in what might be a bolson chair or whatever you want to call it, being lowered over the the cliff to to drill holes, put the powder in, put the uh, blasting cap in, put the fuse in, lighting it so it was timed and hope that the friends got them up out of there before the thing went off. Uh, it was an amazing construction effort, and they thought Palmer was gonna go bankrupt right then. The, uh, a lot of the Eastern investors were stunned when they started to hear what Palmer was doing. They thought he'd never recoup that one. Well, I think that's why uh, they didn't take any pictures of the construction. They were like a lot of the roads. They didn't take any pictures of the construction because they didn't want the investors to see what they were doing. <laughs> After they got it all built and how spectacular yeah. it was, then they, sure. they took pictures and showed them off. Which is so sad because yeah. we've lost a part of our history. We have those beautiful photographs of Palmer, all of them after the railroad was built. Uh, I'd give an eye to to get some of those earlier ones. I'd love to have someone showing those guys hanging over that thing. Exactly. For the sake of history, I'd love it. The man behind the Denver and Rio Grande was General William Jackson Palmer. It was his vision that steered the railroad from Denver into the San Juan Mountains. 
His locomotive steamed over three foot wide narrow gauge rails. This made it cheaper to build and easier to negotiate the sharp twists and turns through the mountains. And although Palmer was a visionary railroad man, the nation's tumultuous financial times and a torrid building pace would eventually undo his leadership of the DNRG. Rio Grande, as we know, uh, had a very precarious uh, history as far as the revenues are concerned. I don't know how many receiverships it went into. As a matter of fact, I was, when I started working in 1950, you just come out of a receivership. Mm -hmm. It was in turmoil all the time. And, and to look back now it, and, and to see and know that there is no longer a Rio Grande, uh, which is... Uh, I don't think we ever thought we'd see that, do you? I didn't. Never. I sure didn't. The Durango and Silverton line was once connected to many routes that formed the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. But in the 1870s, the mines and mining towns surrounding Silverton were far removed from the main rail lines of their day. Transportation was a huge problem. Using mule trains and wagons was slow, dangerous, and impossible in winter. They were sitting on mountains of riches which they couldn't get out to cash in. They pleaded for rail service, and in 1879, advanced crews of the Denver and Rio Grande began surveying a course for what was to become Durango. From there, they marked the 45 miles of mountainous terrain into Silverton. When the line finally reached Durango in 1881, the most expensive and difficult part of DNRG San Juan extension was yet to be blasted out of the mountains. Getting through these mountains is quite a feat. They worked all through the winter with picks, shovels, and dynamite. Incredibly, in just eight months, the Denver and Rio Grande would reach Silverton in the summer of 1882 and immediately begin serving the mines of the San Juan Mountains. Shortly thereafter, a local man who had been building toll roads through the mountains turned his attention to trains, auto mirrors, the pathfinder of the San Juans laid tracks to feed Chattanooga, Ironton, and others. This Silverton line was built across terrain even more rugged than the route between Durango and Silverton. Mears would eventually own three small railroad lines. They transported payloads, supplies, and people between remote mining towns and the DNRG, which would connect them with the world beyond. Mears also built the Rio Grande Southern, an extension that ran from Durango to Ridgeway and into Uray. Along the way, the Rio Grande Southern had stops in Telluride and other mining towns of that era. Altogether, these lines fed a region that became one of the richest mining districts in the United States. One remnant of the Rio Grande Southern is the number 42, an 1887 vintage locomotive that now resides alongside others in the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Museum. Durango and Silverton were two of the busiest railroad hubs in the Rockies. Silverton claimed to be the narrow gauge capital of the world, but even the heydays were not without trial. It was just a fact of mountain life that natural disasters would make things difficult along these tracks. Snow slides were a common headache, completely cutting off Silverton and other towns from needed supplies. The trains bucked untold volumes of snow, trying to keep the tracks clear and supply lines open. Where men and locomotives couldn't clear the tracks, they burrowed through the snow, creating tunnels for the trains. Floods, and especially the flood of the century in 1911, wiped out many miles of track and almost bankrupted the line. Then on top of these hardships came two man-made disasters, the First and Second World Wars. The U.S. Army wanted to take all the locomotives and most of the cars up to Alaska. One thing that happened in the Second World War, which I think we tend to overlook, is that uh, we were running the narrow gauge railroad up in Alaska. They were running out of rolling stock, and they came down here, and they were going to take a lot of the rolling stock off these. In fact, they got some of the stuff off the Rio Grande Southern, but they come over the Rico, who was the state legislator in this area at that time. She fought hard to keep those locomotives and the rolling stock 
They took all the 70s except the, the three that we have left now. Right. Uh, Jim took two. Seven. Yep. The they were going to, I think, take almost all of it if they hadn't, yeah. uh, if Betty hadn't fought them. Fortunately, the last three K-28s in the world are, are here and running today. Otherwise, might, like you said, they might all be gone. Because of the Second World War, the uh, the demise of the narrow gauge uh, started, actually, mm -hmm. uh, because they were doing away with uh, the steam locomotives and replacing them with diesels. Uh, this little train here survived that because of the rail fans that discovered that this little silicon branch was still running. And I owe a debt of gratitude to all the rail fans because if they hadn't discovered that this little train was still running, that wouldn't be what it is today as a, uh, as a passenger train. Well, and then they really discovered it when he took it to Tomahawk came out and they saw the country and saw the railroad, knew that it was still running, and after the war, people finally could buy automobiles again, and they started trekking to Durango. After the wars, the Denver and Rio Grande began a decades-long process of abandoning unprofitable segments of its empire. Silverton and Durango were threatened because the mines were playing out. One by one, Silverton lost the three railroads that had connected the mines and towns around it. By 1942, the only rails in Silverton were the original ones leading back to Durango. Then an unexpected windfall came out of nowhere. Hollywood discovered the train. From 1949 through the 60s, the Silverton branch began to benefit from parts in Around the World in 80 Days, Ticket to Tomahawk, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Rio Grande, and many others. And they made the movie Ticket to Tomahawk, I believe. They painted uh, several cars uh, Rio Grande gold and the railroad liked it. And uh, so from that time on, I believe 1951, they started painting them. An equally colorful side note is the Galloping Goose, a 1933 Pierce Arrow that became a rail-hugging economy bus. They served towns along the Rio Grande Southern after the Second World War, but with the demise of the RGS, the Galloping Goose disappeared. It's too bad because the popularity of the Galloping Goose, which we had on the road mm -hmm. last year, and mm -hmm. yeah. they had been a wonderful um, excursion. If you could have gone from, say, Rico up over the uh, uh, Lizard Head Pass and that thing, but unfortunately, the, it was about 10 years too uh, early. I mean, they pulled it out in the early 50s, and been, if they could have held on to that for another 10 years, it would have been a magnificent companion to this road. Thanks to the restoration efforts of the Galloping Goose Historical Society, Galloping Goose No. 5 survived, and still it runs with specials on the Durango and Silverton line each year. In 1951, the Denver and Rio Grande Western, as it was now called, abandoned the passenger runs that connected Durango with Alamosa and all points east. The railroad wanted to close down the Durango and Silverton branch, too. That year, the passenger traffic was less than 3,000 riders. But due to promotional efforts by local employees and rail fans, passenger traffic increased over tenfold to 37,000 by 1963. And as summer ridership continued to increase through the 60s, the Denver and Rio Grande Western thought the line might just be worth saving. Then, in 1970, a natural disaster, a huge flood wiped out miles of track, and with it, the razor-thin profit generated by tourism. Finally, in 1981, the Denver and Rio Grande Western sold the Durango and Silverton branch. Mr. Bradshaw came in and he had the financial wherewithal, but most important, he had this mission in life to preserve history. He had this sense of what a treasure this was. And it was his drive and ambition and absolute focus on saving this historical heritage 
that has put the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad in a position to live forever. I always say, and I've said it more than once, is the fact that if Mr. Bradshaw had not bought the railroad when he did, this Silverton branch uh, would not exist uh, to this day because it was going by the way as all, all branch lines uh, disappeared. The 80s brought huge improvements in every aspect of railroad operation. The schedule went from one daily train in the summer to five trains and a year-round operational basis. The winter train schedule was brought back for the first time in decades, allowing people to see spectacular snow-covered scenery. The tracks were busier than ever when misfortune struck again in 1989. In the dead of winter, a fire raged through the roundhouse. Striking near midnight, it burned up the timbers above and around the locomotives. At first light, the scene was more like a war zone than a train yard. A historic landmark that had been one of Durango's first buildings was reduced to rubble. But the historic significance of the roundhouse paled in comparison to the outlook for the future. As badly scorched engines were uncovered and pulled from the ashes, many people wondered if the trains would ever run again. Uh, everybody thought, well, this is the end of the railroad. And could have been. Rather than the end, the fire signaled another beginning. The day of the fire, Bradshaw had been in Durango on business. Instead of retiring the line, he decided to rebuild it. Not just the damaged locomotives, but also the roundhouse, keeping as much as he could from the original. Onto the roundhouse, he built a machine shop to ensure the railroad's survival. We have a machine shop that rivals any uh, commercial or industrial facility. We have uh, craftsmen that literally can take uh, a piece of brass and turn it down into a uh, operating component of any of our coaches or locomotives. The unique thing about this operation is we're completely self-sufficient. Ten years after the fire and after two decades of careful restoration, Bradshaw sold to Durango and Silverton. The new owners, American Heritage Railways, continued the tradition of honoring the train's historic significance. I count him as a very good friend and, and, and a supporter, and I think if there's one thing he's instilled in me, and that's toe the line on the history. You know, I think the most significant thing that Al has done with its ownership is uh, enhanced what Mr. Bradshaw had accomplished when he acquired the railroad. And when Al bought the railroad, one of his first directives to me was to open a museum. And that really is just an extension of this living, breathing, operating uh, railroad uh, that's really uh, a museum from Silverton to Durango. So opening this facility has allowed us to further enhance the historical preservation. We talk about preservation, and where else can you go? And literally, you get the smell, the noise, the cinders, the smoke, which we talked about. This is, this is an all-encompassing sort of preservation. Uh, I, I don't think people realize that. They just, uh, preservation is too often just inanimate. If you observing something, well, here it's not. You are involved. You're part of this preservation. If you've ever seen as much dead equipment as we have, <laughs> and, and these fellows work on it uh, all winter long, and like he says, in the spring of the year, uh, when they, they come alive. It's like a breathing piece of machinery that talks to you. You know, the sale by has got a little bit of railroad blood in there, it just starts to work on you. And, and it's just, it's a romantic part of history that uh, most everybody can relate to. It's 
steam engines are a very graceful machine. Um, the sound of, the, of an engine and the, the way the side rods move is, is just, a, it's like a, it's such synchronization and, and uh, it's just a beautiful thing to watch. And if you walk through the roundhouse at night in the summertime and all six engines are sitting there and they're hot and they're hissing and popping, It's like walking through a dragon's lair or something. Yeah, it's really, just yeah, really yeah. a neat thing. They're yeah. kind of resting. Oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience for anyone who takes it. A sense of the past and the present, and it's part of our heritage that's going to stretch into the future. And that is, in essence, what this world's all about, I think. Yeah, steam railroads left us quite a legacy. By linking the east to the west, a railroad altered the face of our nation. Many of our major cities and towns were originally just whistle stops that sprang up along the railways. The steam trains held a promise of progress, opportunity, and adventure. The Drango and Silverton is a lasting tribute to these early locomotives. And today, we all have the opportunity to look back and see this country as it was then, raw, rugged, especially when you see it from the inside of a steam train that's still making tracks through time. I'm Dennis Weaver. Thanks for watching.